um, talk a little bit about is our annual event called VBS. If you don't know what it is, it's like Bible camp for kids. We meet in the afternoons, Monday through Friday. We're so excited about it. It, All the kids look forward to it all year long, and I'm sure you parents do too. Let's be honest. So this year we're going with a wilderness camping explorer theme, and we're excited to announce it's called Camp Kind Away. Um, there will be lots more details to come in the couple in, in a few weeks, but we just want you to save the dates. So make sure you write down June 18th through 22nd. It's here at SBCS. Um, it's going to be a ton of fun, so your kids will not want to miss that. Um, and then lastly, I'm just, as I'm here with all of you guys here on this campus, we absolutely love being here, but we are so excited for what God has for us at the new building. I'm, I think about it all the time, and I know we've all been waiting a long time to just know when is it going to happen, when are we going to start building. So continue to give. Thank you so much for all the generous hearts you guys are giving, and this is going to be, you know, our, our hopefully forever home, a long, long forever home for these kids to grow up in that building is going to be amazing, amazing. So with that being said, I would like you guys to stand up, greet your neighbors, but tell them Go ahead and stand. No, no mingling yet. But I want you to say this. Turn to your neighbor and give them the exciting news that our building plans have been approved. We can start building. Woo! Thank you, guys. for a long time, but, um, but God is so good. It feels like, you know, that, that's one of the reasons I want to do that song, He's in the Waiting. Um, that, it's not called that, but whatever, take heart, uh, take courage. Um, is that just feels like life. That feels like my life. And I, I was praying this week and then talking with a friend of mine, and God was speaking to me about, um, about desperation and about partnership. And... Um, you know, one of the things that we've talked about here, even when we talked about a couple weeks ago, intimacy with God, is that everything good that's ever happened in the life of our church came out of prayer and out of intimacy with God. But what I realized and remembered this week is most of that prayer came out of times of desperation <laughs> and need, and needing God to show up or we're screwed kind of a thing, right? <laughs> and it's been that way when we were looking for a building with Old Rover, and we were crying out to God, he gave us a free place, and it was that way at the next place, and, and then God always seems to come through at the, the very last minute, like, you know, always later than we think, but always on time as far as his plan, because part of what God's into is he's into the relationship, and he's into the struggle, and he's into the, the process, and though we struggle in, in life, and, and some of you in your, in your, the times that you've been closest to God have been when your kids are going through a terrible time, or when you're in high school, and you're going through just a lot of struggles, and you draw close to God because you need to. And I, I realized that when, when God gave us the, the building um, that we're having over at the ranch, it had been because we'd been praying and praying, and I'd been going up on the hill every day to pray, and we were just like, God, what, where are we going to move? What are you going to do? And then that came along, and then we had to pray and pray to get the city to approve our conditional use permit, and we got that. And then we just, I got kind of comfortable because I was like, this is awesome. God is bringing everything He's provided all the right people that we need with the gifts that we need. He's provided people that have money and resources. There's new people. We're going to raise all the money in one day. It's going to be awesome. And, yeah, it didn't work that way. But what God reminded me of this week is, like, that's, that's what happens. Like, when sometimes we get, things are going well, we stop doing the things that got us to that point, right? When things start going well, we stop doing the, the praying and seeking God and the intimacy that really that whole thing grew out of. And um, I know that's the case for me. And God challenged me this week to get on my knees. And, um, and then he did end up giving it to us anyway, right? So, but it's not over because we still need the money. We still need stuff. So there's still waiting. There's still struggle. There's still like part of it because God's into partnership. And the whole thing is partnership. It's not just God doing it for us. It's not just us doing it, but it's us doing it with God. When Jesus um, talked about his ministry, he said, I do what the Father does. The Father's working, I'm working. I only do what I see the Father doing. 
Because whatever the father does, the son does. That father-son relationship of, you know, intimacy with God and out of that, you know, flows everything is how God designed humanity. It's what he designed us to do and to be. And you won't find the fulfillment of the abundant life that you're looking for until you find that kind of partnership. And it's why in this series we've been talking about, you know, starting with authenticity with self, we've got to recognize that, you know, we have a need, that we can't do everything on our own, but yet we also have to recognize that not only are we needy and poor and weak, and that's like we've got to recognize we have need and, and have open hands to God, but we've got to recognize and believe what God says about us, that we are his sons and daughters and that our identity is not where we're at, but it's whose we are, right? And so we... Out of that authenticity of being able to be honest with where we're at because we're not ashamed of, of it because we, we can admit our faults, but we can also recognize the glory and the beauty of who God's made us to be and the identity that he's given us. And then out of that, we can draw near in that relationship to God and develop intimacy with God that results in love for other people. If you try to love other people, if you've never gotten kind of clear about yourself and about you know, intimacy with God, you're just going to hurt people. Because sometimes we try to love people, but we, we end up hurting them because we, um, we're loving them out of a need to try to fill rather than out of an abundance of overflow from God's love. And so that's what we need is the overflow of God's love. And then that works itself out into the world in this thing called the restoration of all things. And today I want to talk about the restoration of all things and explain to you what we mean by that because it's kind of a... A big term, but it, it's related to this whole idea of partnership and of what God's, his, his ancient plan has always been for this world. Uh, it, it's what the hope, the future hope of this world is, and it's what the job of this church uh, and all the church, uh, God's people on earth is. And so this idea of the restoration of all things. And to talk about it, I'm going to have to take you all the way back to Genesis. So um, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to put it on the screen. Genesis chapter 1, when God's creating everything, up until this point in the, the chapter, it says God created everything. Every time God created something, he said it was good. He said it was good, it was good, it was good. When he creates human beings, male and female, in his image, God says it's very good. Here's how God deliberated about it. It says God said, let us make humanity in our image, in our likeness. And those words, image and likeness, it's kind of like somebody that looks like you, somebody that's like you. Like when you have kids, it actually says this about Adam, you know, he had a kid who was in his image. We have kids in our image. We have them, we pass on our DNA, we, they're, they're like us, they look like us. I remember when I first um, met my grandfather, uh, my grandfather had never, my dad hadn't known who his dad was, and he found him late in life, like, you know, found out that his dad wasn't Redarmal, uh, but he was this guy named Wooly. And uh, so I, I should be Todd Woolley, but I'm not. So we stuck with the normal thing. But, um, but when we met my grandfather, I was probably in my late 20s. And my grandfather walked like my dad. He talked like my dad. He had mannerisms like my dad. He kind of, he, his younger pictures looked like me. I had never met him. My dad had never met him. My dad didn't learn any of that stuff from him. It was just in him. Because that's what happens when you are in the image of somebody. And what God created us for is to be in his image and likeness. And in order to do that, he created us in relationship. And we talked about this last week because God existed in relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And God wants us to be in relationship with him and with each other because that's part of the essence of what it means to be human. To love and be loved, to know and be known, to be in relationship together. And so uh, it, God says, let us make human, humanity in our image and our likeness so that they may what? What does it say? So they may what? Rule. You rule. That's your job. So that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the livestock and all the wild animals and all the creatures that move along the ground. God made human beings... In his image as sons and daughters for the family business because God wanted somebody to run the earth. And it's you. In this story, it's the first human beings. God gave, you know, it says in another place that God, uh, the heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of man. The human beings. God has given the earth to us. 
And so a lot of times we look at the earth and we see that it's a mess and we go, God, where's God? Well, God's fine. He's in heaven and he's everywhere. But God has delegated responsibility for the earth to you. It's like if Luke, it's my son, if, 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 like if his room's a mess, it's not my fault. It's his room, right? I'm not saying that it is. Not that it would ever be. Um, <laughs> But when God gives us responsibility, he gives us authority, and he doesn't take it back. And when God gave humanity the responsibility for the earth, he said, listen, we want you to rule over it. Some of the Bible translations say, take dominion. And, and you get this idea of dominion, and it sounds like you're going to have world domination. Well, world domination is God's plan in the right way, because it's under God's rule, he's put humans to rule the earth. But what happens, and this is really important, what happens is in the story later in the garden, you've heard the story of the, the man and the woman and the, the tree and the serpent that talks and stuff like that. So that part of the story in chapter 3 is, is a way of setting up this story of what happened when humanity basically, instead of worshiping and serving God and ruling over the earth, humanity let, got ruled by the creation. So the, the story says this. It says that the serpent was the craftiest of all the creatures that God had made. Now, when God made all the creatures, what did he say? He said it was good, it was good, it was very good. So the serpent wasn't evil, right? The serpent was crafty. It means like wise and really smart, really knows how to get stuff done. And he tempted the, the woman and the man with that same temptation, basically, to wisdom, to saying, you can have the knowledge of good and evil and be like God. Well, they were already like God. They were made in God's image. But he deceived them, and he said, he said to the woman, God doesn't want you to eat from that tree in the garden because, you know, he's just holding out on you. He knows that when you eat of it, your, your eyes are going to be open, and you're going to be wise like me. And so what happens is she listened to the serpent, and the man listened to her and the serpent. And it threw the whole world into chaos. And you remember the story. They're, they're ashamed. They're trying to cover up. They're hiding from God. Their, their relationship with each other is broken as they're blaming each other. The, the, you know, they're, they're running away from God. They're cast out of the garden. All of this stuff happens not just in like a vacuum of, oh, they disobeyed God. It was a random rule, and they broke it. God was just testing them, and they screwed up. No. The issue, and this is the Bible talks about this throughout the Bible. The issue is idolatry. The issue is that they took a created thing and they worshiped it instead of the creator. Because everything God created is good. Is wisdom a good thing? Is making it your God and serving it a good thing? Yes. No. <laughs> Wrong answer. That's all right. I, I had you there for a second. Wisdom is good. Wisdom is good. It's good to be wise. But if you make wisdom your highest good, your highest goal, rather than worshiping God, that's a problem. It's like all the things God created are good. Like we think of the, the kind of the big three, money, sex, and power, right? Listen, money is good. It's the love of money that's the problem. When you elevate money to a God and you live your life for money, you become its servant and you become enslaved to it. It's the same thing with sex. It's a good thing that God gave. He told the people, be fruitful and multiply. They don't, you can't do that without sex. It was a good thing, and God made it good on purpose. But when people make it an ultimate thing, and they make it something that they worship and something they have to have, they end up hurting other people with it. They end up hurting themselves with it. And it becomes not a good thing. Because good things, God created everything as good. But whenever we elevate those things to ultimate things, they become idols. And it becomes a problem. And it's what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. Power is good. You need it to rule over the earth. But when people take power and they make grabbing for power as their highest good, they become, you know, it, it becomes a problem. And that's the story of, of our earth. And you see it played out throughout the Bible as all of the nations are in idolatry and all of the people are, you know, seeking after all these things. I mean, if you think about all the ancient gods, they are actually good things that have been elevated to the level of gods, right? Like Aphrodite is a goddess of love or whatever. Mars is a god of war. There's all these things that are things that in and of themselves aren't a problem. But when you make them ultimate, they're a big problem. And that's what happened here in the story is things got out of order. 
Because the order is supposed to be God is in charge, and he has delegated responsibility of the earth to humans, and the humans rule the earth and have all those other things under them. But those other things become principalities and powers that take on a life of their own and start ruling and enslaving humanity. And so God wanted to fix that. And in fact, he promises from the very beginning to fix that in the garden when he says that one day a descendant of the woman will come and crush the head of the serpent. And it's God's plan that a human, a descendant of the woman, one who is born normal way from a woman, is going to be the one who will save the world and destroy evil and set things straight. Well, that promise goes on and on through the scripture. In fact, it's played out in a million different ways, and I couldn't possibly show you all of the places in Scripture. But I want to show you three psalms that, that are the most quoted psalms in the New Testament that speak to the purpose of humanity and how Jesus fulfilled it and then passed it on to us. First is Psalm 8. It's amazing. Uh, it says this, When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Now, I'm going to stop right there for a second. If you've ever been out on a night when you're just looking at the stars, if you've been out in the desert or out in the mountains and you don't have all the light pollution of the city lights and you just see the beauty of the stars or you see some of the beauty that God's made, sometimes it makes you feel really small because you feel like, wow, in all the vastness of space, I'm just this one little speck. And what this psalm is saying is, God, you created all of that and it's so vast and it make, I might feel small in light of that, but actually, look at what it continues to say. It says, you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands and you've put everything under their feet. So even though you as a human might feel really small looking at the vastness of the universe or the you know, grandness of El Capitan or whatever, you are the high point of God's creation. Not the ocean, not the mountains, not the stars, not the galaxies, human beings created in the image of God to rule over all of it. Now, I put it in parentheses here where it says a little lower than God because in the NIV and in a lot of your translations, it'll say a little lower than angels. And then it'll have a footnote and it'll say or gods because the word is Elohim. And nowhere else in the Bible is Elohim translated angels, but your, your translators sometimes just don't know what to do with it because it's like too good. It's like, are you seriously, humans are just a little lower than God? Like, a lot of times people will say to me, um, you know, I'm only human. Well, listen, human's the best thing you can be, right? The God job was taken, right? So, like, second best is human, right? Human is in the image and likeness of God and ruling over everything under God. That's the point of humans. And they're above angels, Angels are ministering spirits, servants to serve the humans. That's what the book of Hebrews chapter 2 talks about. And it says, you know, which of the angels did God ever say, come sit at my right hand while I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Like Jesus became human. He didn't become an angel. And humans don't, you know, angel's not an upgrade, right? Like human is the best thing you can be because it's created in the very image of God to be like God. Now, a redeemed, restored humanity how God intends you to be is what he wants, not like the broken humanity that all of us have lived with. But God's in the business of restoring it, and that's how valuable you were to him. Satan and the angels fell. God didn't put together a plan to rescue them. God put together a plan to rescue humanity because he loves them, because they're his kids. They were created in his image. And, um, and that's, that's his plan. The next psalm, Psalm uh, 2 uh, says this, it's, it's one of these often quoted messianic psalms. It was a, used as an enthronement psalm for, for the kings of Israel. And it says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Basically, it's God saying, listen, ask me. I'm going to give you the nations for your inheritance. God's plan was always to save all the nations of the world to save everybody. That was his plan from the very beginning. Remember when he chose Abraham? He said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to give you lots of kids. And through your seed, through one of your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God's plan was always for all the nations. It wasn't just for one people. 
In fact, the chosenness of the people of Israel, the reason they were God's chosen people, is they were chosen, the chosen ones to bless the whole world. That was the whole point. That through them, all the nations of the earth could be blessed. Jesus is that one. That one who was going to crush the head of the serpent. That one through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That's Jesus as a human. Because, remember, humans were supposed to be in charge of the earth. We gave it away to the principalities and powers. We gave it away to the devil and all of those principalities and powers. That Those things that when, when made into ultimate things become evil things that take us over and, um, and, and rule our lives. And so, um, so, so God's still in the business of giving all the nations back to his king, and that's why this is quoted about Jesus a lot in the New Testament. Psalm 110, just last psalm that I'll quote to you, where Jesus, this is again quoted all over, basically the book of Hebrews is a, an extended sermon on this psalm. And it says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And the Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. God's plan was always to have a human rule the world under God's authority. It's what became known as the kingdom of God. What would this world look like if God was king? How would things be different? How would God want things run? See, that's the idea of the kingdom of God is that God needs to have his king on the throne who runs things his way. What would that look like? Well, it would look just like Jesus because Jesus is that king and the way he runs things, he says, is very different than the way the rest of the world runs. But God's plan was not just to come and rescue us from the earth to take us to heaven somewhere else. God's plan was to take heaven to earth, to come and restore the earth. And that's why this is so important because so many of us have got this idea that the story that the Bible's telling is a story about just how you can go to heaven when you die. It's not even about that. Like, the whole Old Testament doesn't talk about that at all. The New Testament talks about going to be in the presence of God and going to heaven, but it's never your permanent home. It's always going there to wait until the time comes for him to renew all things, and then you come back with him. And at the end of the story, it's heaven coming down to earth and all things being made new. Let me show you a couple pictures of this. A couple more passages of scripture. Because not only is the restoration of all things the Lord's um, ancient promise or plan, but it's also the world's future hope. In Matthew chapter 19, this is how Jesus said it. Um, And and he said this in the context. Let me kind of back up and just set the context for this. Remember, there's a story of a rich young ruler that comes to Jesus. And he says to Jesus, what what do I need to do to to have eternal life? Eternal life, abundant life, what we've been talking about. He's asking Jesus that question. And Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. Why don't you keep them? And the guy's like, well, I kept them all ever since I was a kid. And Jesus says, well, okay. Then if you want to be perfect, then just sell all your possessions and give to the poor. And then you'll have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. And it says the guy went away sad because he had great wealth. And then Jesus drops that line of it's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to get through the eye of a needle. And that sounds pretty impossible, right? And so Jesus says, uh, his disciples go, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus says, well, you know, with man it's impossible. but With God, anything's possible. Now, so many people interpret that as like, what does it mean to, how does he enter the kingdom of heaven? What does it mean to be, um, does it mean to go to heaven when you die? Jesus isn't saying rich people can't go to heaven when they die. Like, that's to miss the point entirely, because that's not what he's talking about when he talks about the kingdom. Jesus says to enter the kingdom of God. Do you know how you enter the kingdom of God? You bow the knee to Jesus. You give your life to Jesus, and you give him authority over everything you have authority over. Every part of your life, you say, I give it to you, Jesus. I come under your kingdom, and I will run my kingdom and everything I have authority over the way you want it run. See, that's what what it means to come into the kingdom. And it's harder for rich people. Why? They got more stuff. They got a lot more stuff to lay down. If you don't have anything, it's pretty easy to come to Jesus. Like, you got nothing anyway, right? If you got everything, and you have to bring that to Jesus and lay it down at his feet and give it all to his service... That's a different deal. It's harder. 
But Jesus is saying it's not impossible. It's just harder. And Peter kind of gets the point, and so he asks this question. He says, well, well, what about us? We've left all kinds of stuff for you. What do we get? Are we going to get some kind of reward? And what's interesting, Jesus doesn't like go, hey, you shouldn't be thinking about rewards. Come on. Goodness is its own reward. He didn't say that. He actually answers him the question, and he says this. And that's where this passage comes. He says, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Judging not like, you know, uh, like a judge with a gavel, as much as judging in the Bible is the same as leading. Like the book of Judges is all about leaders of Israel, not like people that, you know, sat in court. Uh, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. See, the inheritance that is given to Jesus as the son of God, right? Ask and I'll make the nations your inheritance. It'll inherit all of that. It'll also inherit that eternal life, the eternal life of knowing God, knowing Jesus going on forever. All of this, Jesus says, is reward that as you lay down your life, no matter what it costs you now, you're going to be paid back 100 times over at the renewal of all things and for eternity. Now, let me kind of give you a picture of what that means. I I brought my rope here just so I could kind of help you see it, but this goes on and on um, past back behind the drums and back behind the stage, and it goes on and on for eternity, actually, back there. (laughs) You have to use your imagination for that part. And this basically represents all of eternity, right? And your life is really like, let's say, this little part on the beginning because you started and at some point you will die. Maybe if you live 80 years, you know, if you're lucky, some of you will get to 100, okay? But, um, but for the most part, there's a lot more of the eternity part than there is of the, the life now part. And, and the point is not this. The point is not to say, and I've heard... Like, a lot of people think, oh, this world is not my home. I'm going somewhere else for eternity. But it's not about that because what Jesus is talking about here is about on this earth. He says, at the renewal of all things, when God makes everything new, the word uh, palin again, genesia, genesis, like uh, beginning again. When everything begins again, see, in the renewal, the promise is God's going to make everything new. Remember, the book of Revelation ends with Jesus saying, behold, I am making everything new. He's not making all new things. He's just making everything new. He's renewing it. And the point he's making to Peter here, when Peter asks him that question, is he says, listen, whatever you lose for my sake in this life, whatever you lay down, I promise you it's going to be worth it because you have all eternity for God to pay you back, all eternity that God's going to pay you back more and more than you could ever imagine. That's why Jesus told the guy, you know, sell your possessions and come follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. Like, it'll last a lot longer up there. People are worried about, like, not having enough to last through retirement. Think about this retirement, right? (laughs) Like, whatever you lay down now for the sake of the kingdom, it it goes on and on and on. Because this is God's plan. He's going to renew all things. Another place, he uses a different language. He uses the word restoration. It's actually, yeah, it's actually Peter who picks this up, and he's preaching on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes down and everybody asks, what's going on? What should we do to be saved? And this is what Peter says. He says, repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And then he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through the Holy Prophets. There's a time coming where God will restore everything. And Jesus is going to stay in heaven until the time comes for that. But he's not just waiting around, and we're not just waiting for him to come back. Listen, we wait on the Lord. We don't just wait for the Lord. Like, we don't wait. Like, I know there's a lot of Christians that think, okay, I became a Christian. I'm just waiting to die so I can go to heaven. That's a crummy kind of waiting. That's not waiting on the Lord. The waiting on the Lord is like, wait like a waiter. Like the waiter stands there waiting on the Lord and says, Lord, can I get you anything? Yes, Lord. Oh, Lord, you dropped your fork. I don't know if he ever drops his fork, actually, but I'll get you a new one. 
like waiting on, paying attention to, listening to. Like Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. The, the Son pays attention to the Father. That waiting on the Lord, that's how we wait because it's not like we're just waiting for Jesus to do everything and we don't have a job to do. We have a job to do in the meantime. We have a job to do to see his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, that's what he taught us to pray. Not that we would get everybody out of here to go to heaven, but that his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth the way it is in heaven. We want to get heaven into earth. And, and the way that happens, we'll, we'll get to how that happens, but, but let me just give you a couple of these passages because uh, it says here, at the end of that, it says... Um, that until the time comes for him to restore everything as he promised long ago through the holy prophets. Let me just read for you a couple of those promises because they're so, they're just amazing. And uh, I, I didn't put them on slides because there's just too much and I can't make that many slides um, or they get lost. So in, in, in the first one is like a Christmas one we typically read at Christmas. It says this, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, this is a Christmas time kind of a passage because it talks about a child being born that has all of these amazing titles. But th the amazing thing is, of the increase of his government and kingdom, there will be no end. From the time, from that time on and forever, from the time Jesus came, he was beginning to establish the kingdom. Remember, he came with the message, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's showing up. It's like, it's here now, like it's happening Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And, um, but why isn't the world fixed yet? Like, if, if he brought the kingdom, like, why aren't we all in, like, the peace and, you know, the tranquility and all that? Well, because his plan is kind of a three-stage process. He inaugurated it and did everything to make it possible. Then he put some other guys in charge of it and put them on the earth to run it. And then he's going to come back to finish it. Now, let me, let me keep reading and you'll, you'll see what I mean. In Isaiah chapter 11, it says it this way. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Jesse was David's father. So this is a fancy way of saying like the lineage of David, the king, got cut off. But a shoot is going to come out from that stump and we're going to get a new king who is of the descendant of, of, of David. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding of counsel and might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes nor by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy, and with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Point is that a truly righteous king, a truly righteous leader will set things straight, and that will include dealing with people that persist in evil and in destroying the world. See, a truly righteous leader has to deal with that, and he will, and this is the promise about Jesus. But then look, look at the next part of it. And the wolf will live with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat, and the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, and the young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. How much do the waters cover the sea? Well, they are the sea. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of God, and everything will be back in order, where little children lead animals around, and they're not afraid of any danger, because humans, even little children, were created in the image of God to rule over this creation. And the things that hurt us now are because everything's out of order. It's messed up. 
Because we've worshipped and served, as Paul says in Romans, the created thing rather than the creator. We exchange the glory of God for, you know, images of all of these created things that we worship, that we seek after, that enslave us. But Jesus came to set us free from that slavery by destroying the powers on the cross. And the blood of his cross took away all of that uh, authority and ability of those powers to continue to destroy, to continue to deceive. And then he set us free and has sent us out now with this message to the rest of the world. He, he sent us out as his people to bring the good news of this freedom um, and to implement the victory that he, that, he, that he got, that he bought. Let me just show you one more passage of scripture. This is my favorite, um, probably, probably my, I don't know, I got a lot of favorites, but it's, it's one of my favorite passages of scripture. But Romans 8 is this amazing chapter. And it's got all this stuff in it about, like, there's no condemnation for us in Christ, and God's never going to leave us, and all that stuff. But right smack in the middle of the chapter, it's all about, like, groaning and suffering and creation. And you kind of go, what? What is that? Is it, like, an interruption? Is it have, what does that have to do with, like, the gospel message? Well, it's central to the gospel message. That's why it's central to this, like, climax chapter in Romans. Basically, what, what he says is this. This is Paul, and he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Now, stop right there for just a second. Suffering is our common problem. We all suffer. If you live in this life, you suffer. You feel pain. You you experience loss. You experience sorrow. You have broken relationships. We hurt each other. There's sin. There's death. It's It's a mess. We all experience that. What Paul's saying is our present suffering is like it's on this present timeline, right? This is the present suffering, and it's not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. We've got so much more in store for us. And he goes on and he says this. The whole creation is waiting in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. The children of God... Remember, we were created in the image of God to be his likeness, to be his kids. And Jesus was the perfect son of God. He has been revealed. He has shown us what it's like to have God's son on the throne until all of his enemies are put under his feet. But we have been adopted into his family as sons and daughters that we now, the the whole creation is waiting for you to come into your own, to kind of have your coming out party where you show who you really are. And you really are a son and a daughter of God. You were made in the image of God. It's been covered over. It's been marred. It's been scarred. It's messed up. But God wants to restore you so that the whole creation can see what what a real human's like. What does it look like when a real human comes under the authority of God, brings everything that's under their authority, under the authority of God, and then rules well, administers their life and everything under their authority with justice and beauty and truth and righteousness, The whole world is waiting for that. The whole creation is groaning for that. Because the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. You know, I don't know if the one who subjected it is God because it was his plan or the stupid people who, like, gave it away. But we gave away. We messed up the creation. We shouldn't blame it on God. But there's hope of the restoration. And that's where he continues in the next line. He keeps saying, we know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to this present time. You know what's the good thing about childbirth? It has an end point where you have a baby, and that's good, and it makes it all worth it, at least after a few days when you forget how bad it was, right? Pain actually has a point. It's producing something. What this is saying is like the whole creation is in this sorrow and this struggle, but it's part of the birth pains of something new being birthed. It's this new creation of the new heavens and the new earth. It's this new thing God is doing to renew everything. And transformation sometimes takes pain. But it's not like senseless pain. It's like childbirth. The whole creation is groaning, just waiting and, and it's, it, there's going to be uh, something that's going to happen. He says, not only we ourselves uh, who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly 
as we eagerly wait for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Like we have the spirit, we're redeemed spiritually, but our bodies are still broken. Our bodies still have problems. They still have habits. They still have things that just need to get worked out. And some of that gets worked out in this life. But ultimately, God is going to restore and renew even our bodies so that we can have what Paul calls in another place imperishable bodies so they, they don't wear out, so that they can last, you know, forever like this. And, and that's what he's saying here. We're waiting for this, and we wait for it because we don't have it already, because who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we don't have, we wait for it patiently. So what I'm saying is this. Can somebody turn on the air back there? I don't know. Some of you that have, like, just push the button a couple times to go down, and it's getting hot in here. All right. All right. So, um... We'll be done here in a second. So all of this is what Jesus has done. It's who Jesus is, but it's who we were made to be under Jesus. Like, if you remember Jesus, after he rose from the dead, what he said to his disciples, it'll, it'll make more sense now to tie these things together when you see these key words that Jesus uses in this passage. At the end of Matthew, Jesus is getting ready to ascend to heaven, to sit at the right hand of God, just like in the passage from Isaiah uh, 7, or not, not Isaiah, Daniel 7, where it says that the Son of Man ascends to the right hand of God, and he's given all glory and honor and power, and, you know, his kingdom goes throughout the world. At the end of this uh, book of Matthew, Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, because Jesus is the true human being who has given back authority over the earth because he earned it. Because he destroyed the work of the devil, he crushed the head of the serpent, he undid the powers by his death on the cross, taking all of that down, and he took back authority over the earth. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. Remember that psalm, ask and I'll give the nations to you? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This great commission is in the context of kingdom, of Jesus who has conquered, who is now commissioning his disciples and us as his disciples to go into all the world and to continue to spread his kingdom. Remember how he said it spreads? He said it spreads like, like mustard seed. It's a little tiny seed, and it goes kind of imperceptible, but all of a sudden it takes over your whole garden because it's a weed. It takes over the whole hillside. If you remember last year when the rains came and mustard was everywhere in the hills, that's the picture Jesus is giving of saying, this is how the kingdom works. It continues to increase in small, imperceptible ways, but then comes all of a sudden. He said the same thing about yeast. It, 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 a little bit of yeast, you work it into the batch of dough, it works all through the dough, and then the dough rises. point is this. The kingdom of God, since the days of Jesus, has been increasing and spreading. And Christianity has spread all over the world. There are more Christians on earth today than there have ever been in the history of the world. And people will say that, the, you know, church attendance is declining, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the kingdom is still expanding because there are more Christians and more people, and there's a lot more population but, but even as a percentage of that population, the gospel has gone out all over the world, and it's continuing to go out. But it's not just a message about going somewhere else when we die. It's teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and seeing heaven come to earth while we live, right? It's seeing the kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Like, that's what he taught us to pray. He didn't say, pray that everybody gets away to heaven somewhere. No, he says, pray that God's kingdom comes and his will is done on earth the way it is in heaven. Because even at the end of the story, the book of Revelation the holy city, the, the new Jerusalem, the bride beautifully dressed for her husband. It's mixing all of these metaphors and these pictures, but saying it comes down out of heaven from God and heaven and earth become one. This is the renewal, the restoration of all things. God is not throwing the world away. A lot of times we've gotten kind of the, the impression, I think, from watching like bad 70s movies or something like that, that you know, it's just all like God's just going to snatch everybody to heaven. He's going to blow up the world, and it's all going to go bad. But that's not really the way the story goes. There's lots of bad things that happen in the book of Revelation, but even the word apocalypse has come to mean like something totally different. 
Like, we think of the zombie apocalypse, right? Or we think of apocalyptic, it sounds like, like catastrophic. We use it that way. The word apocalypse is what the book of Revelation is titled, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. It's all about unveiling Jesus. It's not about the end of the world. And we've mistaken, because there's a lot of that kind of stuff in there and imagery we don't understand and bad teaching, we've kind of taken that as like, oh, the world's getting worse and worse and it's going to get worse and worse. No, Jesus said, of the, in- the, the prophets said, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. The prophets said his kingdom will continue to increase from that day forward. Jesus said, my kingdom grows like mustard seed until it takes over the whole world. The kingdom is going to continue to grow. And there's weeds alongside it, as Jesus said in some of his other teachings. There's still evil in the world. There's still problems, and God will sort it out in the end, and Jesus will sort it out in the end. But in the meantime, our job as the people of God is to bring everything in our life, everything we have authority over, everything we own, everything we are, everything that is ours to manage, whether it's our house or our family or our cars or our money or our job, our business, like our neighborhood, whatever we have authority over, we bring that under the authority of Jesus. And those of you that have lots of authority, it's harder for you because you've got more stuff to bring. But we bring that under the authority of Jesus, and his kingdom comes like that. Because as more and more of us bow the knee to Jesus, as more and more of us bring what's under our authority, under the authority of Jesus, and live according to his teachings, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, His kingdom comes and his will is done on earth as is in heaven. His kingdom continues to increase and peace continues to increase and the lion lies down with the lamb. And we can't do it by ourselves just by our own effort to do that. We do it in partnership with God and he's going to finish the job, but we don't just wait around for him to come and do the job. He's going to finish the job, but we got to be doing it until he comes. In fact, that's what this last passage of scripture says and I'll I'll read it and then I'm going to invite the band up to close out with one last song. This last scripture You know, it's Jesus talking, and he did lots of parables, lots of talking about this, but one of the things he says is, you must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you don't expect him. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us, or is it for everyone? And the Lord answered, well, who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing that so when he returns. And Jesus told lots of stories about this, about managers, you know, gives his talents and he goes away and then he comes back and he says, what have you done with what I gave you? Taking everything God's given you and putting it at his disposal to work on behalf of him and not just sitting back and waiting. The one guy that sat back and waited and just hit it got in trouble. Jesus wants us to be about the work he's given us. It's not all him. He's done everything necessary for us to be able to be empowered That he's given us this responsibility, this authority. He's given us the earth. It's our job to manage it. It's our job to improve it. It's our job to take everything we can and bring it under his authority. And that means business should be different. That means arts should be different. That means politics should be different. Because if the influence of the kingdom and of leaven and of mustard seed, if the the values of Jesus start working themselves out one life at a time, one authority sphere at a time, coming under the kingdom, we'll see this world transformed because God's always been about saving the whole world. Not just saving a few people out of it to blow it up. He's saving the world. God so loved the world that he gave his son. We got to love what God loves. So pray with me, and I'm going to pray this prayer as the band comes up and does this final song. In fact, why don't you stand with me and we'll pray. I want to pray in the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, because if you really understand this prayer, it's the revolutionary prayer of what I've just been talking about. Prayed on our behalf and on behalf of our world. So our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.